sometime last month, it was brought to our attention by our lead investor uh, or to be lead investor that they could no longer invest in Navis. And it was due to a uh, legal technicality because uh, they had invested in a cannabis testing lot before. And there's a, a small fine print in most states regulations. Um, it's kind of a idea of separation of church and state where if you are a financial interest holder or an owner in a testing lab, you cannot actually own an operating company. And I think that that regulation was probably written in, with good intentions. But it was certainly disappointing to, to hear this at the 11th hour. We had essentially told everyone that uh, this was happening and to go back and tell them, um, actually, our, our lead who's been vouching for this round is pulling out. Please remain in the round. This is Start with Storefront, the podcast where we inspire entrepreneurship through truth. Today's guest is June Lee, co-founder of the cannabis wholesale distribution company, Navis. To anyone even remotely paying attention, it's clear that the public perception on weed is rapidly changing. To date, weed is legal for recreational use in 18 states plus DC, while another 13 states have decriminalized its use. The winds of change are blowing, and they're headed towards legalization on a national level. The only question is how long it will be until we get there. For many though, the race towards market domination began long ago. June saw a budding industry with loads of untapped potential back in 2017 when he founded Navis. In just four short years, he's taken the company from a single van making once a week shipping runs to serving over 100 cannabis brands and almost 100% of California's licensed weed retailers. So listen in as we cover everything from why he had to initially hide his career choice from his parents, why big shipping companies like FedEx haven't gotten into cannabis distribution, and why there's no brand loyalty in the weed market. Now, back to the episode. All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to June, founder of Nabis. Thanks, Thanks for, having for me. joining. Tell everyone a little bit about what your company does. Uh, Nabis is one of the largest cannabis distributors based in California. We have presence in Oakland and LA, and we essentially transport products from brands to dispensaries throughout the state. And what made you want to go down the road of getting into the cannabis industry? You know, it was mostly accidental. So I was a software engineer before I got into the cannabis industry and was running an enterprise SaaS company. And uh, by happen chance, I um, had a friend who owned a pre-roll company. Uh, this was right before, at the cusp of legalization, who needed help moving his products around. Vince and I thought it was one of the cooler things we'd been offered to or asked to do. So we decided to drive up to Humboldt and, and pick up some products and drive it down to uh, San Diego, Oakland, a couple different places. And, so literally uh, like transporting the goods. Yeah, okay. yeah. It became kind of a hobby. We thought it was really cool, made us feel really cool. And it was completely on the side. And... I think both Vince and I knew that there was something big happening in the cannabis industry and that something was going to happen. And I think naturally being software engineers, we're always looking for kind of systems um, and distributed ways of doing things. And transportation specifically seemed like an area where the problem wasn't fully solved. And then what was your first step? So once you guys are doing it yourself, you're seeing the problem. What was the first thing that you guys decided? Did you quit your jobs right away and just start no, working on it full no. time? So I was running my startup full time. Vince was consulting at the time and Vince, my co-founder. And at first it was just a drive once a week. And then it became twice a week, three times a week. It got to a point where it wasn't sustainable. So we hired a couple of our friends to drive for us. And then customers kept coming back because um, we had this very simple value proposition that if you called us, we'd show up on time and deliver your products on time. And, uh, not steal anything from your bag or your cash. So, and it was D to C, or was it to a business? It always uh, B two B. So okay. at the time, um, we would move products from farms to either processors, manufacturers, or um, you know a, a company like Ease, for example. Okay. And are you using like trucks at the time, or is it just like your car, basically? Like Whatever can fit in the trunk. Yeah. Uh, back in 2017, it was just my SUV. Okay. Yeah. And then at some point, when did you guys go? All right. We're too busy. We're doing these runs all the time. Mm -hmm. Did you guys think about raising capital right from the jump? Or was that something where you're like, let's get some more traction? We wanted to get more traction. So we bootstrapped the company with $6,000 each from the co-founder. So we had $12,000. We purchased um, with that a uh, dinky old Mercedes Metris, which we later used for larger runs. Sure. Because uh, uh, the, the bags yeah, stopped fitting in, in the back of our trunk. 
And it felt to us very much too early on to kind of really pivot our career. I think um, some context is, uh, you know, I come from a very Christian, conservative Korean family. Vince uh, is Chinese American. And I think the idea of us kind of quitting our prestigious full-time tech jobs were very difficult at the time. So we, we only decided to make that full-time transition after we received our full state license. And I think at that time we had something like five to 10 regular clients that were shipping products with us. How did you tell your parents? I didn't tell my parents for a long time. They actually found out through a series of articles that came out about us. Um, I think the first major- Good public- articles, I imagine. This yeah, is, generally yeah. positive. You know, yeah. uh, these two young kids are doing something cool in cannabis was usually the theme, I think, in the early days uh, in 2018. Uh, Did that help at all? Did that oh, help? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I very much feared the idea of going to my parents and explaining it from ground up because um, I knew that they wouldn't fully listen to me or, you know, they would think that I'm doing something reckless. But when they saw it on Forbes, it, it certainly spoke a little bit of credibility and, you know, made them think maybe there's something June is doing here. When did you guys apply to Y Combinator? We applied to Y Combinator a bit late uh, in terms of the stage of the company. Yeah. Um, we were part of the 2019 winter batch, which means we applied sometime in mid-2018. Okay. And you got in. Mm-hmm. Did it change your life? Did you love it? What was your experience there? Who, yeah, it was great. I, I, don't, I don't know if I would necessarily call it life-changing, but it certainly provided a framework of building a company with intent. So... I think right up until that point, we were just kind of doing whatever that worked, um, trying to experiment, change our services in a way where, you know, with the objective of more customers coming to us and asking us things to do. But I think Y Combinator really allowed us to look at, kind of zoom out, look at the company from a company level and understand what are metrics that we didn't even track back then, things like ARR, our annual run rate, burn, headcount, things like that. I think it gave us uh, a lot more structure. Do you have like any, or do you have a memory of like your, the best piece of advice somebody may have given you while you were there, or maybe even your favorite, like advisor partner? Mm-hmm. But the one that's most memorable is, uh, it came from Michael Seibel, I, was gonna, I think. That's my guy. Yeah. He's, yeah, yeah. he's Mike, the best. Yeah. Michael Seibel, CEO of YC. He's also our group partner. And it, oh, it, you got super lucky. Yeah. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah. And I, I might be misquoting him in, it's something to the effect of, investors don't actually care about what you do. You have to be able to explain it in a way that's um, easy to digest. And to think that you can kind of distill this really, really complex thing that you do full time in a two minute in itself is arrogant. And so you have to really build a narrative and a story that can be digestible. Um, yeah. And that's the most important thing. I've seen him destroy startups. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's like, this is you. And then he'll draw a line going right down, like plummeting. And he's like, this is you tomorrow. And I, I mean, silence. Yeah. At that point, I'm surprised um, they made it into the Y Combinator program. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people, you know, they pivot when they're inside of it and they realize, I would say like a third of the ideas kind of drop off. Yeah. And another one I'd say is he, he talked a lot about kind of making an analogy to flight and pilots. Um, and apparently there are certain orientation of the plane that if you're in, doesn't matter if you're 1,000 feet elevation or 10,000 feet elevation, you're going to crash. So regardless of how much money you have in the bank account or you know what kind of hype you're generating in, in the investor space, if the company is structured in a way where it's spending too much money or is, if it's set up incorrectly, regardless of how high you are, it's very, very uh, easy and almost deterministic that you would fall. Yeah. Uh, this is something a lot of, uh, so I have a lot of friends and we talk about this that have started companies. There's a point in time in a company's journey where you, it's usually not a happy time, but you kind of understand the mistakes you've made, but the course has already been set. Yeah. And now you have to live with these consequences Mm -hmm. and it's awful usually because it's too late. Like it's way too late in the game Mm -hmm. to kind of move. But it sounds like for you guys that things are moving the right way, directionally correct. Things are generally moving the right way. This is also why I say directionally correct a lot. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Um, I guess to kind of illustrate some of that, now we're a 170 person company, two offices. Um, We have a built out engineering team, very capable supply chain operations team as well. We supply about a hundred distinct brands to essentially every single dispensary in the state of California. And about 10% of all legal cannabis consumed in California comes off the back of our trucks. So I think that's, uh, that's a huge percentage. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, is there a big player or are you the biggest player? 
There are a couple of big players. Uh, we're definitely one of the biggest. So the distribution market in cannabis, especially in California, is still very fragmented. And there are three major distributors that control about 30% of the market and we're 35% uh, of the market and we're one of them. When you guys first started raising, was there any pushback or did you have to kind of to, to Michael's point, did you have to really educate them on what it was that they were investing in on mm -hmm. the industry, where things were going? Yeah, I think thankfully our messaging was easier than perhaps some other companies in our batch. Uh, so if you're developing something like a very obscure developer's tool or backend API, it, it requires definitely a, a much more difficult and creative explanation. But our pitch was that we ship weed from brands to dispensaries. And I thought that was a pretty simple enough thing to sell. And I think especially in 2019, when we were going through YC, there was a lot of enthusiasm about the new space, uh, the changing regulations and a rapid destigmatization of the substance itself. I think even five years ago, cannabis was mostly seen as a recreational you know, drug and uh, something that teens abuse to get high or et cetera. And I think I, I felt that firsthand growing up in Virginia, but just in the last five years, public opinion has shifted quite drastically. Yeah. The devil's lettuce. Yeah, you look at the number of states who have now legalized it, and the trend is certainly moving towards national mm -hmm. level uh, mm -hmm. legalization. Exactly. How many brands would you guys say you work with today? Uh, a little over 100. And what do you do for them? I know you guys do a lot for them, but yeah. it'd be good to just kind of disclose. So there are a number of services that we provide, but essentially one is distribution and fulfillment. Uh, what that means is we'll pick up their product from anywhere in California, we'll warehouse it out of our facility, and essentially upon their direction, we'll pick and pack and ship out the order to the dispensary. Um, so it's very similar to kind of like a traditional drop shipping model, but on the wholesale side. Now, we've added a lot of ancillary services on top of that to create value. One is a product called Nabis Marketplace, uh, which is retailer facing. So all of our suppliers and brands can list their products for sale on our marketplace and retailers can place orders. There are some other ancillary marketplaces out there like LeafLink, but I think the big differentiation that we have is that we're kind of like eBay is to Amazon Prime. We, since we control the dispatch itself, we can deliver the products within 36 hours, uh, which has been a big differentiator. The other products, um, there's one called Navis Capital. We provide uh, essentially um, inventory financing for our suppliers. It's very difficult to gain access to capital in cannabis because one, banks uh, don't give you traditional loans like a normal business. And uh, even equity capital is very limited and you have to be able to tell a very compelling story to, to get that expensive equity capital. So uh, we kind of serve as this bridge as a financial institution, given the fact that we're a little bit more established, we have access to capital and it's, it's a good way to you know, stimulate the, the, the sale. That's amazing. So if I'm a brand in this space, would I exclusively work with you like I'm just thinking about, I had a product company at one time. And mm -hmm. so it was like, I have inventory here. I have some on inventory on Amazon, mm -hmm. right? And then, so we had someone on the podcast created like basically a way to just connect all your inventory. Right. So it's all in one place. Is this the same problem in your space or no? A little bit different because it's regulated and there are certain requirements for how you need to handle the products. Okay. So in There's California, like a higher barrier least, to entry on that side right. of it. Okay. Um, so you can't just ship cannabis with any provider. You can't FedEx your weed. So essentially there needs to be. Why? Uh, Why? Um, what because does FedEx it's not do that? Is it the legality of it? Um, it's one is the legality of it. And then there's kind of the justification for why it's set up that way. And there's a number of reasons. One is California really wanted to implement this thing called seed to sale. Uh, essentially, they wanted to be able to trace from the moment the cannabis plant was harvested to when it ended up in consumers' hands. And when you have such strict supply chain procedures, uh, you need specialized groups that will kind of comply and you know, disclose all those things and et cetera. And FedEx clearly uh, isn't particularly specialized to do that. Um, the second reason is there's, you know, concerns around cross-contamination. So people like weed now, but they're still not really sure if it should be shipped next to baby products, for example. That's fascinating. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, I think generally, I think this, this will probably remain the case the same way I think alcohol distribution, for example, is extremely specialized and not just regulated substances. Um, if you're transporting hazardous materials like, you know, flammable gases, there are certain procedures yeah. that you follow and licenses that you need. I was going to ask if this is the same where alcohol, tobacco are also not allowed to be transported next to say baby products, or if it's just pot. Yeah, exactly. They specifically don't want to mix alcohol and cannabis because they're kind of concerned about, you know, the so-called cross fadedness. I mean, there's a big opportunity in that obviously you're taking right. advantage of that. That's so fascinating. One of the things that I, I don't, 
smoke pot, but I do invest in pot stocks. Mm -hmm. And the barrier for that and, and the problem with that has always been that, at least when I started investing, there was no brand recognition or brand loyalty in terms of mm -hmm. consumers going like, you know, let's say you go into a grocery store and you are a Coke drinker, mm -hmm. you will always get Coke. Yeah. And there just doesn't exist something like that in the, the pot world. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering, since you deal directly with brands all the time, have you seen this start to shift? Is this a continuing problem in the industry? And if so, how do they overcome it? So brand loyalty is something I think is built over time. And the industry is just simply too young for people to kind of have a Coke Pepsi parallel. I, I would say that strong brands in cannabis are certainly developing, but uh, compared to any other CPG, it, it still remains extremely fragmented. And sometimes we feel that we have found the brand for our category. So for example, you know, for cannabis gummies, there's uh, Plus Gummies, uh, Kana, Caminos, et cetera. And they seem to be pretty stable as in they were, you know, in, in their place. And then suddenly last year, this Oregon brand called Wild comes in and they took over the market, um, essentially took huge chunks of the gummy market from existing players. And I think that really jolted people in, in thinking that, no, we, we haven't got to that stage, gotten to that stage of um, customer loyalty that we thought we, we had. Is there anything that surprised you about the space that you would have never thought about or guessed? Yeah, I'm a consumer casually, but uh, I wouldn't by no means characterize myself as a power user. I think I was definitely surprised by the complexity of the products, the sheer diversity. Um, so, you know, people talk about flour, pre-rolls, vape, concentrates, beverages, like some of these larger categories. But even within concentrates, there are so many different variants and within it, different types of extraction methods that people care actually very deeply about. Same with alcohol. You know, I think uh, you see these... Um, enthusiast wine drinkers or single malt whiskey seekers. Uh, and there are very close parallels to that in cannabis, but I'd say it's even more deep than, than alcohol is. For you personally, like, are you still engineering? Are you still coding or have you moved on? I have, I still participate in our engineering meetings okay. and our product roadmap, but <laughs> okay. um, I haven't myself coded in about two years. Nice. Mm -hmm. Do you miss it? Or are you happy? You basically uh, play like chief product officer kind of? Uh, well, I mean, my, my role is officially as president, but I, I generally, my, my primary duty is actually overseeing the business unit of our company. So our revenue, business development, new clients, um, structuring deals, as well as running our operations, which is consisting of 150 people, 50 trucks, two warehouses. So it's a lot of moving pieces. And that, in weird ways, is very similar to what I learned as a software engineer managing distributed systems. Um, kind of, it's like the art of doing a lot of things simultaneously at the, the same levers, time. The levers, levers everywhere. And then the product side currently rolls up to my co-founder, but we're very interchangeable and we have this kind of nice brain meld since we've known each other for such a long time, we can kind of step into each other's shoes. Will you guys ever go like autonomous vehicle, like autonomous trucks? Is that is that sort of something that really makes the business pencil? Yeah. I mean, it, it, we, we envision a lot of cool new things in the future. I think probably before autonomous vehicles, we want to start experimenting with electrical vehicles, um, electric vans. And one of the things that we're doing there is currently electric vans are very useful for any deliveries within the range of up to 400 miles. But after that, it becomes very difficult to do. The problem with California is that it's quite large and uh, there are places um, that are certainly more than 400 miles apart. So as our long-term strategy, we're actually building our headquarter fulfillment center right now in Wood Lakes, which is kind of a uh, 30 minutes south of Fresno. And that allows us to kind of sit right in between the five where we can access both LA and Oakland within 400 miles. So we're hopeful that's kind of these long-term infrastructural investments that we're making would enable us to do that. Autonomous vehicles, I think that that probably will come with the, uh, how the auto industry evolves. But. Sure. When it comes to your warehouse, are you using like any state-of-the-art technologies? Is it mostly machines? Is it mostly human beings? Right now, it's um, mostly human beings. And I would say that our warehouse technology itself probably lags behind um, state-of-the-art consumer goods by something like 10 years. And the reason for that is because we're simply just not at a scale where investing in a million-dollar robot makes sense. We do have best practices, industry best practices, like location-based inventory tracking. So 
across our hundred brands, we're managing something like 15,000 distinct SKUs. Um, and we intake and outtake about 70,000 units of products every single day out of each hub. So it's important that we, for example, have an organization system, warehouse management system that keeps track of where everything is. We also do things like wave packing, um, which is just a, a kind of a industry standard way of uh, packing a lot of different things are. And we have tools like forklifts, gra uh, gravity conveyor belts, and, and so forth. But it, it's certainly not looking like Amazon full phone. When you yet. think about the systems that are already in place, do you look at them from a software engineering perspective and go, oh, this is like really clunky, this is really bad? Or are there, you know, pretty good sophisticated companies in that space that are making beautiful products to make sort of the, the management much easier? Oh, yeah. I mean, there, there are so many people making just extremely impressive product, both on the software side and the hardware side to enable logistics and warehousing in general. And I think with the rise of e-commerce, the, the investment in that uh, endeavor has only uh, increased dramatically. I do think that at Navis, at least, we have a tendency to try to build things ourselves because we are engineers. And the use case for cannabis can be a little specific enough that, um, you know, the, the standard out of the box software may not address the concerns. I forget the company. Well, do you remember the company that Amazon acquired? It was for their warehouse. It basically was the thing that picks would, up the, the racks. Yeah. It was these two guys who worked at this company that started it and they were both engineers and they would basically just track the movements of humans. And so they, they just put dots where humans were and then they just watched the dots move around all day. And then they were like, I think we can probably engineer this in a better way. And so right. they started, I think they quit their jobs at some point, but they started going down the road of like creating these robots. And they sold it for several hundred million dollars. To, About 900 million, yeah. yeah. And to Amazon. I'll uh, be honest, it sounds a bit dystopian to think of it like that, to think of yeah. like human movements. Well, it's all about efficiency, engineering. right? They were just trying yeah. to make it like, and, and, and at first the thought was not so much to replace the human. It was more of like, how do we make these movements much more efficient? Right. Because Patty is in that corner and some, for some reason she needs to grab mm -hmm. gloves over here. That makes no sense. Right. And so as they're going down this road, they were like, we think we can make this robots. And then, mm -hmm. But it was like these guys were, I think, in their late 40s mm -hmm. when they started the company. Really cool story. And they're like, yeah, now we're like, yeah, yeah. Now they're like, yeah. now they're set. Now they're, you go to set. an Amazon fulfillment center, you just see these shelves flying um, across each other at extreme speeds. And, yeah. you know, they have algorithms to prevent them from colliding from each other. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. And so you just closed a big round. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Max was just here telling us about it. Uh-huh. Do you want to share your story on how this uh, almost sure. didn't happen? Raising money in cannabis is definitely challenging, and it's a, it's a different beast because um, essentially what we have is a technology company that happens to own some infrastructure and the license to actually transport the goods. And a lot of people ask, like, why don't you just decide to be a software company? It would be, would be so much more investable, easier. The reason why we did both was because it was what we felt was best for the customer experience. When you order something, you expect to get it in a certain amount of time. And in an immature industry, it's really important that you control uh, that experience. Um, so we made that kind of tough call to be both plant touching and technology early on. But we kind of are now running into this problem where kind of Silicon Valley tech investors can't invest into our company because we're still plant touching and they may have... LPA restrictions, I say they can't invest in vices or federally illegal uh, goods or whatever services uh, in cannabis. And then we also have a kind of a class of supply, more traditional supply chain investors who fail to see that we really are a technology company. They try to assess us only on the trucking aspect. And, and Vince, my co-founder, leads a lot of these fundraising conversations, but it's really that uh, conveying that message correctly and, and finding that intersection of people who's uh, first comfortable investing in cannabis, but also see our potential of being something potentially really scalable. We started raising the round early this year. Um, and, you know, frankly, it wasn't a terrible time to raise. You know, there's certainly a lot of enthusiasm around cannabis with the Democratic Party taking super majority. There was a lot of kind of promise and hype around like, will cannabis uh, get furthered and from a regulatory perspective in the next couple of years. And uh, that led to kind of a, a quick rise in the public markets. You, you mentioned that you invested in public cannabis stocks. Although that enthusiasm has somewhat quelled because uh, it seems like the administration has other priorities for, for now. But regardless, uh, we were able to kind of find the interest pretty quickly. By February, we had determined a lead who essentially started the due diligence process. By March and April, we had a term sheet. Um, we had all the legal docs kind of final. And the last steps were just kind of doing the paperwork and corralling the rest of the, the investors in. 
But sometime last month, it came to our attention or it was brought to our attention by our lead investor uh, or to be lead investor that they could no longer invest in Navis. And it was due to a legal technicality because uh, they had invested in a cannabis testing lab before. And uh, there's a, a small fine print in most states regulations. Um, it's kind of an idea of separation of church and state where if you are a financial interest holder or an owner in a testing lab, you cannot actually own an operating company. And I think that that regulation was probably written in, with good intentions. But it was certainly disappointing to to hear this at the 11th hour. We had essentially told everyone that uh, this was happening and to go back and tell them, um, actually, our, our lead who's been vouching for this round is pulling out. Please remain in the round. And I think we really kind of pulled off this gymnastics. Thankfully, one of our earlier investors um, rose up to the occasion and decided to take the lead instead. And the outcome at the end was favorable. So definitely grateful. That's amazing. So basically, the growth rate for you is to also tied to facilities. Right. Somewhat. Yeah. Somewhat. And so now you're in hyper growth, uh, entering this real estate world that operates at a snail's pace. Mm -hmm. And somehow you're just trying to get as much land right. and warehouse space as possible. Mm -hmm. And so what do your needs look like in the next year or so? So right now you have this 20,000 square foot place that you're doing. In Los Angeles, we have a 26,000 square feet in Oakland. So uh, all in all, we have about 46,000. If the math is correct and our projections are correct and we continue to grow at the rate that we do, by the end of next year, we will need something like 150 to 200,000 square feet of warehouse space to handle the volume. And that would be to support about 20 to 25% of all cannabis in California. Now that's a, that's a big number. There's 40 million people in California and uh, California and support Californians love to smoke weed. And I see that as kind of a pretty large responsibility to enable the supply chain. So we're really racing on our end to procure the real estate, the licensure, um, and the, the headcount. And it's not just the space. It's uh, about, if we're going into a new city, it's about talking to the government about the municipal taxes, letting them understand that we're bringing this new type of business to their city, that we're going to be hiring hundreds, hundreds of people, uh, and actually hiring those people, training them, and then you know getting it up and running really quickly. I definitely think that we've really trained our muscle in turning up a facility really, really quickly. So, um, you know, for example, our Oakland warehouse, um, which is 26,000 square feet, opened in December of last year. And we started working on our LA facility after that opening. And we, we, we were operational in LA, moved in with licensure and approvals by April. And that was certainly uh, a gymnastics. In your experience, what's the reception been like when you approach a new town or city with like, hey, we're going to bring this several thousand foot warehouse space in here. Are they generally receptive because of the uh, taxes, the employment and everything? Or it, does it mirror the state of California's attitude towards weed overall? I think it depends widely. Generally, it does mirror um, California's views in that um, there are more municipalities that are favorable to cannabis than not. But there are certainly um, also localities where they are absolutely and vehemently against um, any cannabis operation. So I think it, it's definitely a political matter. Um, assuming that they're okay with cannabis, I think generally we've been met with enthusiasm um, meeting with the city, mostly because it means that we're bringing a lot of business and employment to the city and kind of uh, so-called putting the city on a map in terms of their uh, infrastructural significance in the California supply chain. So this problem is interesting because what's happening is there's a lot of smaller counties, smaller cities like the city of Bell or Commerce, as an example, and they're all like racing to change their legislation because there are actually are rules in place today that say they cannot be uh, basically affiliated with cannabis of any kind. And even though you're, I would call it like on the fringe of it to some extent, like you're not producing it, it's still unfortunately part of the their bylaws. And so you have all of these cities changing it. What's interesting though, the opportunity, the way I think about it is there are some cities that control their own power grid, like Pasadena and a bunch of others. And so what ends up happening is a company like yours can come in and really dictate terms because all of a sudden they're going to get money, not only from the taxes, not only from the, let's say the jobs, but also just from the fact that you're using utilities at a way higher rate. And that's exciting. Yeah. And so you can almost get like the keys to the kingdom. And then if you latch on to like a political candidate, you know, yeah. It's, it, it's payday because anybody that's savvy in the political game is go like, let's say a small town mayor is going to say, oh, this is it. This is my ticket. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to ride the wave. Yeah. And so, you know, they don't always think like that. But 
we play this game a lot yeah. in real estate development. And I think to my surprise, the, the regulatory bodies in California have been very supportive and favorable so far to emergence of companies like Navis in, in cannabis. I think when Prop 64 was drafted and passed, um, they only had kind of a faint idea of how the supply chain was going to actually play out. And for there to be uh, an aggregating party like us, uh, where you know we do funnel 10% of the market and hopefully more in the next couple of years through our system, when we have built a system that's essentially auditable by the tax authorities to make sure that you know all the taxes are be- are being paid, and you know it kind of creates a central point of responsibility that the state feels very comfortable managing. So, unlike I'd say other industries that sometimes are inhabited by incumbents, it, it's been uh, relatively easy to kind of uh, get in front of the regulators and speak to them. When it comes to hiring, so Amazon mm-hmm. was obviously in the New York Times recently, all their practices, mm-hmm. not very favorable. Yeah. Big headline risk. When it comes to you guys, how do you view hiring for the warehouse space in general? Because it would seem like that's really not your world at all, right? Software engineers, and now you're... Yeah. Although I'd say, you know, now I've been doing this longer than, you know, I was a software engineer. So we're definitely kind of exercising that muscle. Hiring is, is really important to us because, I mean, ultimately, uh, the organization is nothing more than the sum of the, the people that are part of it. And we have this dual challenge of um, attracting really tier one talent, an engineering team that would be a good engineering team at Facebook or a finance team that would be a good finance team on Wall Street and bring them over to, to cannabis is, is kind of a one big lift that we do. And that's by just really convincing them and, and, and echoing this message that what we're trying to do here is truly something unique. It hasn't been done before. And this is a great way for people to really apply their talents in a, in a new space. On the warehousing trucking side of things, uh, it's certainly a new area, but I think that there's actually a huge overlap of people who are passionate about cannabis and people who work in the warehouse fulfillment side of things. So we find that nice intersection and they kind of naturally select because we review the candidates that we receive applications from. And it usually comes with the fact that they're open to cannabis because, you know, if you're fundamentally against cannabis uh, and the growth of it, then why would you come work out of cannabis? That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And so it hasn't been that difficult. Training. I, I, yeah, I think it, it's been doable. I mean, the, the thing that we struggle with now is, you know, when the companies, for example, grown um, about 50% from January of this year in terms of the total volume and revenue that we do, and we've grown about 180% since this time last year. And when you're a small company, when you have a team of 50 people, growing 10% means hiring five more people. But when, you know, at our current state, when we almost have 200 people, growing 10% means hiring 20 people so really kind of building out that pipeline and you know being present at career events and you know approaching universities and those are those are some of the more scalable things that we're excited to do um especially with this round that's awesome what other things are you guys going to do with this round do you think i think about it like are you guys ever worried about i don't know if amazon would enter this space but like a behemoth entering the space in a really meaningful way like that's got to be something that it's something that really excites me because uh, I, I just know that it would be far cheaper for them to buy someone like us than to build it themselves. Is that your, what your hope is or do you, yeah, like, in, a, in a perfect world? Yeah, of a good feeling. Well, I, I, I see that as a potential way this could play out. Um, I, I think Vince and I both definitely build this company not for an exit, but really focused on the fundamental value that we're creating. And I genuinely and personally believe that um, this is an opportunity and a problem set big enough that I could work on it for the next 10, 20 years. Yeah. You know, if you think about how long it took after prohibition for alcohol to be as mainstream and widely distributed as it is today, um, you know, it took over 70 years. And I think with the the advent of Internet and these technologies, uh, it might get accelerated, but I don't think it's going to be kind of played out in the next couple of years. For me, this is such a blessing because I've always wanted to work on infrastructure projects. And I felt that as a 20 something year old, there's always this huge barrier of entry, mostly around capital to play these sorts of, you know, infrastructure games. And I'm sure you feel that way in real estate. It's like, you know, you, you kind of have to work your way up to, to a certain point. And Navis kind of gave me this fast pass to running and, uh, and orchestrating a trucking company at a young age. And I think I, I definitely want to make something of this opportunity. I love it. When it comes to like, so in my head, when I think about your distribution, everyone's wearing neighbor shirts. Is it like, what, what is it like if I walk into one of your centers? Yeah, so generally people will be wearing our shirts, our polos, um, but we don't enforce a strict uh, dress code. I think compared to other warehouses that you might be in, we're more casual. Um, 
And I, I would also say that our workforce is generally younger than um, an average workforce in other supply chain companies because, um, you know, I think there are more young people that support and like cannabis than others. And people, young people coming out of college are really seeing cannabis as a career. They know that this is here right now and it's only going to grow for the next 10 years. So they're going to do something, maybe pick a box, uh, you know, deliver a box um, at some point, but eventually go into really specialized fields like cannabis compliance law or, you know, track and trace system and, you know, getting, getting proficient with metric and these systems are uh, something that people really want to do. So at some point you also have a tremendous amount of data, right? You see these products moving, you see the market moving in certain directions. Is there any interesting data that you see taking off more than others? Like are, are edibles moving at a pace that's like quickly outpacing? Mm-hmm. There's some interesting trends. I, I don't think as kind of broad as like edibles or, or, or things like that. But for example, we know that beverages are growing. Uh, is a rapidly growing segment of the market. Are uh, these like CBD infused beverages or, or like so THC? So we deal with THC infused only, uh, cannabis derived. So there's a, you know, a hemp CBD business that we're actually legally barred from participating in because we hold a cannabis license. That's really fascinating. I want to touch on that a little bit yeah, later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it, it didn't start out as a big segment uh, to begin with because essentially manufactured cannabis, I mean, when you want to make a beverage, you need a bottling line, you need a factory, you need uh, a way to infuse liquid at scale. So it simply wasn't possible before legalization. And with the rise of kind of uh, sparkling water seltzers like La Croix and, you know, White Claw and, and all these kind of segments, I think people are anticipating and pouring a lot of money into making the next cannabis seltzer. That would be the White Claw of cannabis. It's still a small segment. It's less than 1% of consumption in California, but it is something that we're definitely watching out for. Uh, for example, Navis exclusively represents Paps Sweet Ribbon and their seltzer line uh, in, in cannabis. Paps has a yeah. seltzer line? With- a lot of the beer companies invested. I mean, that makes sense. Like I just that. didn't know Paps yeah. Blue Ribbon. Mm-hmm. Because it was, it was the biggest market in terms of expansion versus beer. Right. And they're scared. Um, they think that Uh, young people, young health conscious people aren't drinking enough beer um, and that they want to pivot to zero calorie options um, in other forms of intoxication. That's certainly true. Yeah. Is it Mark, is it branded different than like the the blue ribbon? They, they use the same logo. It's called Tapsure Ribbon Cannabis Seltzer. So it's a very like blue collar marketing effort. Yeah. That's a way I can see brand loyalty start to develop. Exactly. Is when recognizable brands come into the space, Mm -hmm. you've already you know, odds right. are you've already gotten There's an association a, a, affiliation mm-hmm. with them. Exactly. Yeah. And then there are other categories that have been popping like uh, in 2019, early 2020, uh, we saw a rapid rise in the category called live resin. So essentially when vape pens first started coming out, they were all distillate chemically distilled product, almost like isolates of THC and people started kind of uh, developing some adversity towards something as artificial. So the whole concept of live resin is taking a fresh frozen plant and squeezing it, you know, sometimes with solvent, sometimes with, uh, without it. But the idea is to kind of get closer to the flavor of the, uh, the plant itself. And now that's evolved into kind of live rosin or what we call solventless extracts, where they only use ice and water and pressure to extract the cannabinoids from the flower. So that way you're really taking in the raw form and then translating it into a vape product. There's like research papers that came out on like cannabinoids in like the 90s. And to think about what mm-hmm. you're doing today, that's basically my lifetime. Yeah. Is it, it's, it's almost so insane. If you, yeah, if you go back 30 and years. I realize I sound like an old person saying that. But <laughs> it, it's like we had Beam on the podcast. Who's this, they make a CBD product. And so for them, like that's why I was like going through the, the whole, okay, there's no barriers to entry in this space. Everything is built on brand or at least they're approaching it to build a brand first. They're going after the mainstream athletes. They basically want to be like the, the Coca-Cola in the space. And they're doing that via investors with big names, essentially. So like the celebrity route and uh, you know, they're doing a good job, but we were talking about these studies and they were like, not that long ago, you know, 20 years ago, there's when the studies were coming out. And now all of a sudden we've accepted that cannabinoids can like help in a meaningful way. And going back to what you said about not being able to hold a license in CBD or hemp because you have a a cannabis license. Do you see that changing in the future? Or is that something that there's actually a reason for outside of just what we just discussed, Mm -hmm. where it's like old philosophies that have come and and aged poorly and, and were really like smear campaigns from back in the early days? So I'm certainly not an expert in, in the hemp side of things, but what I know is that there's been a lot of ambiguities legally as to how each state um, and the U.S. should regulate hemp. 
uh, and whether hemp is, should be even considered a cannabinoid or a, can, a cannabis product. And I think uh, in 2019, um, was it the Farm Act? Uh, US, uh, basically, the U.S. federal government said that hemp is fine. Um, you can put hemp in products, and each state and municipality can um, regulate how hemp is distributed, actually. And in that kind of like time of ambiguity, I think a lot of people saw that as a business opportunity, started up their hemp operation. But California specifically have, has been really conflicted in how to regulate hemp. Right now, I believe that um, hemp's, uh, hemp products are not allowed to be sold in traditional retail, and they're actually banned from licensed cannabis dispensaries. As a licensed cannabis distributor, we're not allowed to touch any hemp products either. So for now, we're just kind of following the, the rules there. And, you know, I think hemp also is a different beast and a different supply chain in that um, interstate commerce of hemp is now essentially legalized. So, you know, you can bring in hemp from China, you can bring hemp from Mexico and essentially turn it into a product here. So it lends itself to a very, very different supply chain than a, a closed loop system like cannabis. Are you saying that there's not much interest on your part in getting into that? Not for now. And... There's a couple of reasons for this. And one is because I think that just substance wise, cannabis derived products are more interesting to me personally than hemp. I think hemp has a very kind of singular effect or CBD as a main cannabinoid. And I think the uh, there's some marketing that's uh, challenging. Actually, the, the mi minimum active dose of CBD is almost 50 milligram and you won't find um, 50 milligrams in most hemp products. So in order to actually feel the effect of CBD, you would have to chug five bottles of a, a hemp drink, which I don't think is a, is a very reasonable and, and palatable experience. Second thing is that I think we... <laughs> well said. Yeah. <laughs> Second thing is that, you know, we, we built out this software ERP and a supply chain very specialized for cannabis. And I think I don't normally talk about this with investors too much because I, I can sound a little, it could sound lofty, but I, I do think that eventually uh, NABIS could branch out outside of cannabis. But even beyond hemp, there are a lot of regulated substances uh, that require this disclosures and submissions. Things I mentioned, hazardous gases, alcohol, tobacco, medical supplies. Uh, I think those are areas that we could potentially get into. Would you ever close the loop with just having your own stores? As in verticalize and actually own the stores and the yeah. supply chain? Yeah. No, that's actually contrary to what most people are trying to do. They're trying to like verticalize and be a vertical company and to, to improve their margins. But... I think ultimately we believe that a more exciting future for the cannabis industry is where products and brands compete. Um, there's product churn and innovation and customers get to decide what products they want. And I think, you know, when you walk into a liquor store in Arizona, you could find Grey Goose on their premium vodka cabinet and you can walk into a liquor store in Vermont and find the same thing. And you ask yourself, like, why is that the case? And it's not because customers like Great Goose. It's because someone decided that that was the, the premium vodka of America. And I think that is a very limiting view of how um, the market should evolve. And I think that when you verticalize, there are a lot of temptations and just forces that make you want to remain still in, in favor of innovation. Well, listen, where can people find you? Whether they're looking for a job, whether they're... Yeah. Obviously, you just closed a round, so you definitely need to hire immediately. No, for sure. So our website is nabis.com, N-A-B-I-S.com. Uh, so you can read all about us and slash careers, um, all of our job postings, our mission, our value as a company is listed there. You can also reach out to me directly. My email is june, J-U-N, at nabis.com. Look, you've definitely, uh, this has probably been the quietest we've ever been on a podcast. Yeah. Only because uh, I know nothing about your space and I just find it so fascinating, but it's for sure very abundantly clear that it's the future. This was an information session for us. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So thank you yeah. for talking most of the time. No, of course. <laughs> yeah. Was that enough content? Was there anything else that yeah. I could no, elaborate no, on? That, that was, Unless that you was want to touch on anything else. Yeah. Uh -huh. Every industry, I feel like, has something where, for you guys now that, that like you said, the Democratic leadership feels a very different way than the Trump leadership did. Yeah. I'm sure it has kind of eased a little bit more, like when, were people, when Jeff Sessions was the yeah, AG. Yeah. Were people like, so we tried to build a jet fuel, a jet fuel refinery. This is like 20, not Jet 20, fuel was, refinery. Jet fuel refinery. Green jet fuel uh -huh. specifically. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to build a plant in Everett. So Everett's like right by Boston, mm -hmm. and then you can just put it on a train and mm -hmm. then put it in a tugboat, and then boom, you're just tugging it to, right. to Logan, which is uh -huh. like the most efficient way of doing it. Because right now, so Logan, any fuel that arrives at Logan Airport, 90% of it's from war-torn countries. Oh, I see. And so we just wanted to basically make it local. In doing that, our pro forma was Mitt Romney versus o o Obama at the time. Uh -huh. Barack Obama went very public around 
basically saying, yes, biofuels are the future. Mm -hmm. Mitt Romney said nothing. And this completely changed the landscape of our raising capital. Mm -hmm. And it just destroyed it. It was like in one setting, the economics worked. In the other setting, it very it really didn't. Right. When it came to the election for you guys, was there any similarity where investors were like, let's see how this plays oh, yeah. out? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, cannabis stocks certainly performed very well after the Democratic supermajority. I think... People are certainly a little disappointed at the speed at which cannabis legalization is being considered or prioritized. Essentially, Kamala Harris and Joe Biden said they have some more important issues such as COVID vaccination. And, you know, some may argue justifiably so that take precedent (laughs) over um, legalization of cannabis. I think that, I mean, ultimately, we're not in a big hurry per se, because one thing we know for a fact is that product market fit of cannabis does not need to be proven. People like smoking weed, they spend money on weed, and uh, they will continue to do so as long as kind of, uh, you know, this generation lives. That's an interesting way of putting it. I mean, you're right. Mm -hmm. You're right. Yeah. It's like a fascinating, there's not many industries where that exists. Right. So it's not um, like, you know, in the example of jet fuel or or, or green jet fuel, it uh, it might be a case where the actual cost of production or efficiency might be slightly higher than traditional methods, but for moral purposes. Um, it's, it's something politically we should decide. Cannabis has a, a very opposite effect where like it is proven that people want this. So it's more the uh, politics is controlling the speed at which it is uh, being released as opposed to enabling something that wouldn't normally happen. Welcome to real estate development. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> God damn. I'm always waiting on politicians, even right now. And it's infuriating because yeah. you have like real dollars, you know, there's imagine. holding costs, right. right? And we're just waiting for someone to just go to the office. But we also want to make sure it doesn't happen too fast. That's true. Um, I mean, there's something to, yeah. We want it to happen in our terms. And I mean, I kind of mentioned in my, in the company video, but we we do see that the only viable path of, you know, scalable cost-effective distribution is a national distributor that facilitates the movement across state borders. And that's just the inevitable future because it's an economies of scale business. Where Um, will you go after California? What's that? What state will you focus on next? Part, actually, to answer your previous question around our raise, about half of it is going to be dedicated towards out-of-state expansion. Um, we're looking at a couple of different states. Uh, New York, Jersey is particularly interesting to us right now. We also have to make sure that the municipality or the state that we're going into is favorable towards a model like ourselves. Um, you know, do they allow consignment distribution? Do they um, allow you know what, what uh, distributors to hold inventory for long periods of time? Like, there are all these kind of factors that make our service more valuable or less in a certain state. But I think most likely New York. Um, I think we'd love to kind of enter that market when it opens up. It's a greenfield opportunity. There's a big warehouse space in Sunnyside, New York, that Brooks Brothers used to uh, work out of. Oh, okay. And it's massive. Yeah. Massive. There was like seamstresses, the whole bit. Oh, wow. Full of fabric. Yeah. No longer the case. Unfortunately, you can't move cannabis uh, across state borders. So even if we were to open up in New York, okay. we could bring the software, the brand IPs, and the brands could be there. But the cannabis will have to have grown in, in New York. And same thing for New Jersey too. So like you couldn't, even though they're bordering states, you couldn't just transport it across. Yes, those because interstate commerce oh, makes it a federal matter. Yeah, it's inferior. Yeah, yeah you're and, in real estate development. That's what you're I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's massive inefficiency. Because like Oregon, for example, had an overproduction issue where essentially a pound of weed was like just as valuable as pound of corn at some point because there was an excess of products and there are all these other states where there's a shortage. And, you know, they have, they can't do anything. But do investors sell. know this? Like yeah. when you speak to them, they're aware of this, basically your growth rate, not to some extent, but at least the national expansion is literally tied to the legislation. They know that? Yeah. Yeah. I think generally, well, I mean, some of them do, some of them I have to explain, but I think it's something that definitely comes as a surprise when I say like everything you buy in a dispensary in Massachusetts has been grown in Massachusetts. Right. Because that's, that's how they you know, built it. You don't it. see that in any other supply chain. Yeah, Massachusetts was early, and that's what they basically built mm-hmm. it in that way on right. purpose. And it's not energy efficient to grow um, cannabis in Massachusetts. It's just cold there. And uh, you have to build these massive indoor grows or greenhouses that has a lot of energy consumption. And, you know, there's some studies that show that indoor cannabis consumes about three orders of magnitude more energy than sun-grown cannabis. So, like, why are we really doing it? Um, sure, there's demand for designer weed, and people really like that indoor feel because it's expensive. But I think eventually that, that will kind of phase out as um, cultivation techniques and out, uh, outdoor definitely kind of matures and evolves. What are the coolest products that you've seen that someone uses cannabis with, like, that I would never think of? 
that you would never think of or haven't like i'm not a, i'm not i would i would barely put myself in the recreational user uh-huh. yeah so there's a really interesting company called vertosa um and they're not a brand they they manufacture these fast acting cannabis um, extracts that have been coated with some sort of polymer so that it binds to your body faster than standard cannabinoids uh, do. And they go into a lot of beverages like Pabst Ribbon, Can, and so forth because when people drink something, they want to feel the effect immediately. So there are a lot of these like tweaks being done, like how to, uh, ways to chemically coat the can uh, cannabinoids to change the way that they're absorbed. I think that's really cool and something people don't really appreciate or realize when they, when they drink a cannabis beverage. And this is new technology, right? It, had, it didn't exist two years ago and it's, it's being used. Uh, there's also a lot of studies in isolating different cannabinoids. So, you know, CBN around uh, sleep has been explored more now, but there's still a huge, uh, I think, area of research that remains. Yeah, well, thank you very much for, <laughs> for coming on and no, educating us about everything. It makes mind blown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, yeah, really, it's such a foreign industry to me, but I, I am fascinated by it because it's still in its infancy, very much so. This is like the thing I told you on the phone was like my buddy was a Wall Street trader in Chicago mm -hmm. or not Wall Street, but the Chicago trader. And he is now in the cannabis industry. Oh. And when I spoke to him about it, he's an older guy, but he's basically like, it's, it's the best space if you're smart. Yeah. He's like, there's been so much lack of sophistication in the space. And now all of a sudden uh, with your company, tech yeah. company, people with backgrounds that could help this industry accelerate are now coming in from all walks of life. So the finance, yeah. kind of like you mentioned, like if your team rivals Facebook's engineering mm -hmm. team, if your finance team rivals some of the best teams on Wall Street, these are the things that this space yeah. is starting to see. And uh, it's a really exciting time. No, for sure. To be if part I may of add like a recruiting sound bit. Um, Do it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think if you're if you're smart and you're curious about cannabis and you want to learn more, it's, it's really an, no other opportunity like it. Essentially, it's a market that's being formed out of nothing. California legal cannabis market went from zero dollars in revenue in 2017 to $4 billion in revenue uh, in a single year. And you don't really see that in, in any other uh, industry. And I think it's easy to make kind of comparisons to markets like crypto, but you know, I think it's, it's fundamentally different in that you're converting an existing behavior into the white market. So what are some company perks? Company perks, you get statewide discount in any dispensary in, in wow. California. So What's the discount? How much is that? Usually around 30%, sometimes up to 50%. That is wow, um, massive. Um, yeah. yeah. So if you're a big smoker, that certainly helps. We also oh my have God. kind of employee partnerships. You can sign up for Flower Co., which is Costco of Cannabis, uh, where they deliver uh, next day cannabis to you for extremely cheap. Other perks, you get to see all the new innovative products before they hit the market. So, you know, some people in our warehouses are even more knowledgeable and enthusiastic about these things. And they just love being able to be in the front line and seeing what the market will see in a couple of months ahead of time. And do you guys get to test them too? Like, do you get to try them a little bit? Sometimes. Yeah, uh, I can imagine sometimes they would send you like, hey, these are... Right, right, right. So blah, our, blah, our blah. brand partners are generous with samples. Um, now people get me cannabis. I have no no idea what to do with them because I have uh, enough cannabis in my in my drawer to smoke yeah. for the rest of my life. Yeah. So it's I have it, a warehouse full. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so I think that that's cool. And uh, it's an intense working environment because the industry is changing so much. We have to respond to regulations and competitors. You know, I I definitely kind of warn future employees that like if you're looking for something chill and you know you're riding on the coattail of a cannabis industry, this is not the job. Well, thanks, June. Yeah, oh, man. Appreciate it. Thanks very much. <laughs>